In this clip, we will introduce the components of net radiation. In particular, we will focus on the role of the atmosphere in determining the downwelling radiation at the surface. Net radiation is the driving force of the surface energy balance. During daytime, the supplied energy is removed from the surface by the latent heat flux, or EFP transpiration, sensible heat flux, and the soil heat flux. At night, on the other hand, the net radiation usually acts as a loss term for this surface energy balance. The surface net radiation consists of two times two terms. Based on the wavelength, we distinguish short wave radiation and long wave radiation. Shortwave radiation originates eventually from the Sun, and longwave radiation has been emitted by the atmosphere or the Earth's surface. Based on the direction, we distinguish downwelling radiation and upwelling radiation. To understand the downwelling terms, we need to understand how the atmosphere influences radiation. We distinguish two processes here absorption and emission on the one hand and scattering on the other hand. Note that at the top of the atmosphere, no longwave radiation arrives. Outer space is sufficiently cold and void of emitting gases that hardly any longwave radiation arrives at the top of the atmosphere from outer space. We treat absorption and emission together, because, according to Kirchhoff's law, the absorptivity of an object is equal to its emissivity at a certain wavelength. So if we look at the atmosphere, the ability of a certain gas in the atmosphere to absorb radiation of a given wavelength is equal to its ability to emit that radiation. Absorption and emission happen at very specific wavelengths. The location and width of these absorption and emission bands depend on the molecule you're considering. It depends on its phase, as well as the temperature and pressure at the location where absorption or emission takes place. In the figure to the right, we see the absorption and emission bands for a number of gases summed over the entire depth of the atmosphere. For a range of wavelengths that covers both shortwave radiation to the left and longwave radiation to the right. Note that the emission bands only indicate at which wavelength emission can take place. However, it depends on the temperature of the air whether or not emission will actually take place. For instance, the atmosphere is not warm enough to emit shortwave radiation. The other process through which the atmosphere affects radiation is scattering. The direction of propagation of radiation is altered by the interaction of radiation with particles. The type of scattering depends on the size of the particles relative to the wavelength of the radi radiation. For small particles, scattering occurs equally in all directions. Whereas with an increasing size of the particles, the scattering becomes increasingly anisotropic, that is, dependent on direction, with a stronger and stronger preference for the forward direction. If we consider shortwave radiation, radi scattering takes place due to particles of the size of individual mo molecules. Me scattering occurs due to aerosols and small cloud droplets, and scattering according to geometric optics happens due to rain droplets and large particles. For the largest particles, the index of refraction of material plays a role as well, in addition to the relative size of the particle. Now that we have identified the two main processes, we can look at the effect that those processes have on the radiation that arrives at the Earth's surface. The directional dependence is altered, the spectral composition of the radiation is changed, and finally, the amount of radiation is altered, or the radiation is subject to extinction. We will focus on the effects for shortwave radiation here. The effect of scattering is basically that radiation changes direction. Hence, when we look at the Earth's surface, no longer all radiation comes from the direction of the Sun. A part of the radiation has taken a different and longer path before it finally reaches the surface, but another part took a path that directs it away from the surface. The atmosphere reflects some radiation back to outer space. Still, for a cloudless atmosphere, a considerable part of radiation is direct radiation.
this changes when clouds are involved. Three things happen. First, a larger part of the radiation is scattered backward and sideward and finally leaves the atmosphere. Secondly, as a result, the total amount of radiation that reaches the surface will be smaller than for cloudless conditions. And finally, the additional scattering by cloud droplets has the result that a larger proportion of radiation that arrives at the surface is diffuse rather than direct. This difference is clearly visible if we look at these observations. Whereas for the sunny day only about 20% of the incoming radiation is diffuse, for the cloudy day nearly all of the radiation is diffuse. Further, the total amount of radiation is of course much less for the cloudy day. Next, we turn to the effect of the atmosphere on the spectral composition of the radiation at the Earth's surface. But before we get at the Earth's surface, we start here with a picture of the radiation at the top of the atmosphere. Here we see the spectral composition of the short radiation arriving there at the top of the atmosphere. The curve resembles the Planck curve for an object with a temperature of around 6000 Kelvin. But it is not as smooth as a Planck curve. This is probably mainly due to the absorption of a part of the radiation by the outer layers of the Sun. The part of the spectrum that we as humans consider visible radiation is indicated with the arrow. This part happens to be located around the peak of the spectrum. Next, we consider the direct radiation at the Earth's surface. This is the radiation that arrives at the Earth's surface from the direction of the Sun. In general, we see that the total amount of radiation is lower. But there are a number of special wavelengths. At very small wavelengths, we see radiation missing, which is partly due to the absorption of, ra of radiation by ozone, but also partly by the preferred radi scattering of short wavelengths. In the near-infrared region, to the right, we see a number of holes in the spectrum. These are due to the absorption by water vapor. Next, we look at the diffuse radiation, which arrives from all other directions than the direction of the Sun. This is due to scattering. But also, we recognize the signature of absorption by ozone and water vapor that we've seen before. In addition, we see that the diffuse radiation has a relatively large contribution of shorter wavelengths. This is the blue of the blue sky. And here we see again the signature of the preferred scattering of shorter wavelengths. So whereas the peak of the total radiation more or less coincides with the peak of the radi radiation at the top of the atmosphere, we see that for diffuse radiation, the peak has shifted to the shorter wavelength and for the direct radiation to the longer wavelength. Finally, we look at the effect of the atmosphere on the total amount of radiation reaching the surface. We've already seen the signature of absorption, which takes away part of the radiation. But scattering also reduces the total amount of radiation at the surface by changing the direction of a part of the radiation to a direction away from the surface. So radiation that is scattered upwards does not reach the surface. Now we revert to the observations and compare the total amount of radiation between the sunny day, which is the dashed line, and the cloudy day, which is the solid line. We see a large reduction in the amount of radiation by clouds. Interestingly, we see one time interval in the afternoon of the cloudy day where the radiation exceeds that of the sunny day. Most likely this is due to reflection of sunlight from the sides of some bright white clouds. We can already see the effect in data that is averaged over 10 minutes, like here. But if you would consider data with a shorter averaging period, like one minute, this effect can be much stronger, with radiation amounts exceeding the clear sky values by 10 up to 20%. So, to conclude, we have seen how the main driver of the surface energy balance consists of four terms, which are distinguished based on wavelength and direction. Two processes were identified through which the atmosphere influences the radiation reaching the atmosphere. Absorption and emission on one hand and scattering on the other hand. The effect of those processes are that the radiation is changed in terms of directional composition, 
spectral composition and in the amount.